the Chris. Welcome, Science Slam. What's up, everybody? I'm Chris. Uh, thank you guys very much for being here. I get the pleasure to introduce you guys to Sigvaterra poisoning. So as you can see on this beautiful picture here, this is in the US Virgin Islands. This is where I first learned about this poisoning. It's an endemic issue to this area. Um, have anybody ever heard of the 10 plagues of Egypt? Yes? Perfect. The first plague being a river of blood, right? Everybody remember this one? So this is caused by microalgae that if they grow in enough abundance can turn the color of the water red. So this event still happens today. You can see it um, throughout uh, the, the North American coast as well as in Asia and Europe as well. Um, so apparently we haven't learned our lesson yet. Um, but these microalgae, and in addition to being able to grow to such abundance to change the color of the water, they can also produce toxins. So ciguatera poisoning is actually caused by toxins from microalgae. So unfortunately, you can't see the, the change of the water color from ciguatera poisoning. Um, it's basically invisible to the naked eye. This is something that Captain James Cook found out on his second voyage of discovery. So here shows his three voyages of discovery in 1786. Uh, he was poisoned here in the Pacific Ocean. So his crew came across the entire Pacific Ocean. Um, they finally found land. They were so tired of eating dry bread and, and old sauerkraut that as soon as they threw the anchor down, they threw in their fish hooks and pulled out two huge fish, big red snapper. The crew was excited. They threw it on the barbecue, feasted like kings uh, until a few hours later. So a few hours later, the cook notes in the log that anyone who ate of the red snapper fish came terrible maladies, incredible headaches, uh, their joints started hurting, their knees were weak, they couldn't stand. Five of the crew members had to be laid in bed for four days straight. They couldn't work, couldn't do anything. Uh, luckily, everybody survived except one dog, one hog, and one parakeet who were unfortunate enough to get into the leftovers of this food and all died. Um, across the ocean, in the, uh, in the Caribbean, in Cuba, a uh, famous naturalist was also experiencing the same issue in 1787. Him and his family got poisoned uh, from a terrible bout of, of ciguatera poisoning. Um, they had vomiting, diarrhea, joint problems, uh, headaches. Uh, they couldn't sleep, they couldn't work. And the naturalist decided to name this poisoning after the, the, uh, the organism that caused the poisoning. So they called it Sigua after the snail. That was the local language for the snail that poisoned him and his family. And he named it Sigua Terra. So now we know Sigua Terra worldwide. So this is a phenomenon that affects over about 500,000 people every year. So ciguatera, unlike red ties, you can't see it again, it's invisible. So if a, if a seafood product has ciguatoxins, this can lead to ciguatera poisoning. So if you are unfortunate enough uh, to come into contact with a seafood product that contains ciguatoxins, you can expect in the first three hours to have uh, terrible nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, headaches, uh, joint problems, temperature reversal. So hot things feel cold, cold things feel hot, terrible maladies. Um, sometimes these, can, these symptoms can last for days to months to years. They can even reoccur from drinking coffee, alcohol, tobacco. Uh, some of these other products can re uh, re-stimulate the, the symptoms that you had after the original poisoning. In extreme cases, this can lead to coma and even death. So where does this come from? Who's to blame for this terrible malady that changes the temperature that I feel on the outside and has these headaches and nausea? And, um, well, actually, the source of these toxins, ciguatoxins, are from microalgae. So tiny single-celled dinoflagellates that grow on the, on the surface of algae in the marine environment. So if you were to go in most places between 34 degrees north and 34 degrees south around the world, if the water is over 16 degrees Celsius, you can expect to find some of the species of Fukuyua and Gambia discus. And these two genera, they can produce ciguatoxins that can lead to ciguatera poisoning. They don't look so tough, right? They're these little guys, we can take them. They don't look like such a big problem. Well, the problem comes in when these little microalgae grow on macroalgae and fish come by and eat them. So when fish comes by and eats a blade of algae, they ingest all the toxins in all the cells that are growing on top. And this can lead to a food chain occurrence where these toxins start to accumulate. So a larger fish will come by and eat 10 of those smaller fish and accumulate all the toxins that they had. 
This works its way up to the food chain where you get to the big fish, and they come by and eat all the middle-sized fish and accumulate all the toxins that are in there. So this can become a problem for the human consumer and lead to ciguatera poisoning. If you are unfortunate enough to get ciguatera poisoning, you can send us a sample. We'll be happy to work it up. What we would do is take a piece of that fish, mash it up, and then send it through a series of liquid-liquid partitions, extraction processes. What we're trying to do is clean up the sample so that we can analyze it in a purified sample way. So now that we have a purified sample, we're ready to go to our analytical portion. We use a two-tiered approach. So first, we look at a bioassay. We want to see if the sample is toxic or not. And then we move to an analytical approach where we can tell exactly now what compound was present in the sample that led to the toxicity. Previously, we used to use a mouse bioassay. Now we use a cell-based assay. So we apply the sample that's been purified uh, to a cell-based assay without the use of cute, tiny Timmy and Tommy mice. Um, if a sample is toxic to the cells, then we move to our analytical portion, and it can tell us exactly which compound was present that led to the toxicity. So we figured everything out. We've got the methods down. We can help uh, determine what, what compounds are in which fish, from which areas. But there's always a, a, a trick to the problem. There's always something more uh, that can complicate things. So in 2017, there was an outbreak of ciguatera poisoning in Germany from the north to the south, the east to the west overall. Uh, we got some of that sample. We were able to use these methods and apply them uh, and figure out exactly what compounds were present in these fish and at what levels. The problem was that the label that the fish uh, carried wasn't what was inside the bag. So this creates a problem of you, if you want to authenticate the fish and attribute the correct toxin to the right fish, sometimes that's not always possible if the fish inside doesn't match the label. So this creates a bit of confusion for the consumer if you want to go and buy a certain type of fish and the label says one thing and you can't get it. This can create confusion and a problem, not just from uh, a hazard perspective of ciguatera, but also uh, mislabeled products. So what can you do as a consumer? What, how can you protect yourself? Well, if you want to be fly like this gentleman here and travel the seven seas and explore and try all the local fish, please uh, consult the local consumers about what fish they think are safe to eat um, and follow their lead. Um, allow them to introduce you to the, to, the, to the fish and the regions that they consider safe. Um, if you do want to catch your own fish and eat them on the barbecue, just avoid the head, the eggs, and the liver, so some of these organs can contain the highest amounts of toxin. Um, if you are poisoned, make sure that you call the uh, poison control, let them know what happened, and ask for some help and assistance. And don't forget to support science, so keep that sample, send it to us, we'll be happy to, to do some research and, and uh, work on the next project for that. So. Thank you guys very much. So you can find me and ask me any questions on any platforms. Uh, thank you for your time.